Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. See some familiar faces and some new faces. So welcome everyone. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with me on this gorgeous early fall Wednesday afternoon. Um, I am recording the session, so it will be available for um, folks to view at a later time. Also, if you'd like to share with your colleagues that maybe were not um, able to make it this afternoon. Um, I'm not entirely sure where they'll be posted just yet, but I will um, I will be sure to um, probably the YouTube channel. I'm thinking they're probably going to be um, posted on the MTSS YouTube channel. Um, okay, and also for um, your time this afternoon, I will be providing a link to a one hour um, uh, certificate of participation. So you can um, have that for your records for those of you that are still collecting hours or collecting hours, hours to keep your certifications current. Um, okay, so this is week one of a MTSS toolbox series that I have put together um, that is essentially designed to provide participants an opportunity to learn about um, a new um, MTSS tool, implementation tool that maybe they already know about or that they have never heard of, and to kind of bring light to some different tools that I use a lot with schools when I'm working with schools, but also um, provide some insight to places where you can find tools to use based on your individual circumstances in your district or in your school. Um, and most of, and all of those that I will highlight over the course of the next um, few months is are tools that either I have used or would use or would recommend using. Um, and as always, if you have questions about different tools or different um, websites that, you know, that are visited throughout the series, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, and ask questions because I'm happy to um, dive into some individual conversations about what your district or what your school might be challenging and what might be helpful for you um, um, for different circumstances. So uh, today's session is actually um, meant to feature MTSS around the main DOE. So as I was thinking about what to put together for the first um, session, I was thinking, you know, there's really a lot happening in MTSS across the DOE. And it might be nice to just have an opportunity to kind of go through some of those areas where MTSS is already happening or is happening um, across the DOE. Um, some of these things you may have heard of, others maybe are going to be new to you. Um, and certainly as I was going through and putting together today's um, session, I really was like, wow, there's a lot of MTSS happening and there's no way that we're going to be able to highlight all of it. So I have made a little note to myself um, to try and come up with a way to um, deepen this conversation over time because we're really going to um, just scratch the top of the iceberg, I guess, um, is the best way to put it when it comes to all the different supports that are available um, for multi-tiered systems of support um, that are happening across the main DOE. Um, so if you're here from the DOE and I miss your program or I only skip over or just like gloss over your program, um, please don't take offense <laughs> because I really tried to pick um, some of the high frequent flyers for today. Um, and really when it came down to it, it was, it was impossible to get all of the supports into one short um, 50 minutes to an hour of time together this afternoon, especially um, where I also really prefer to build in um, some discussion time as well for folks to um, break up the time and have an opportunity to really think and process and ask questions. Um, so that leads me into the format of today's session. Um, so there are four different programs that we're going to look at today um, and dig in a little bit to some of the um, some of the, you know, specifics of each of the programs and how they contribute to Maine's um, MTSS efforts. And then what we'll do is um, I'm going to break you off into a couple of small groups. And after each 
program we go over, I'll, I'll send you into a breakout room. And then in that breakout room, I would just ask you to um, first, you know, introduce yourselves really quickly, get to, get to know who's in the room, um, just help build networking across the state, which is another huge part of building multi-tiered systems across the state in Maine. But also then to just sort of discuss, like, have you heard of this particular initiative? Are you participating in this particular initiative? And if so, what could you offer to those that are in your group that maybe have never heard of it or are not currently participating in it? Um, and then maybe like discuss what questions you have amongst each other um, in terms of that particular item. And so um, it's a pretty tall order for the next hour. Um, so um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so as always, thank you for being here. I, I appreciate the time that you're spending um, and don't hesitate to ask questions or reach out if you have them um, as we go through today's slides. So just a little bit about me in case you've not worked with me before. Um, I'm Andrea Logan and I'm the multi-tiered systems of support specialist at the Maine DOE. Um, I do work out of the Office of Innovation, Teaching and Learning. Um, I am rounding out the very tail end of my uh, four years of being at the DOE uh, thus far. And it has been a it has been a wild ride. I apologize for the um, sirens if you can hear them. Collectively, I have about 21 years in education. Um, part of which being a middle school classroom teacher, um, which spans across special education and regular education. Um, I've been an interventionist, an instructional strategist, um, a classroom management coach, and a, an ELA curriculum leader for middle school over the course of the last 21 years. Um, and I really enjoy being here and that this topic tends to be something that I really like to geek out on. So um, I always look for opportunities to expand the conversation whenever possible. Um, so at the Maine Department of Education, our mission is to promote the best learning opportunities for all Maine students and all of the work and information that I have prepared to share with you today um, is intended to support these six, five strategic goals rather, and to support the mission of the DOE with a commitment to those goals. So um, everything that we talk about today is really intended to help to bolster our commitment to inspiring trust in the organization, developing and supporting um, educators and creating a robust educator workforce, promoting educational excellence and equity, ensuring student school safety, health and well-being, and supporting a culture of innovation and, and continuous improvement. So what is this particular session all about? So by the end of the session, participants will have a better understanding of the efforts being done around the DOE that align with Maine's MTSS framework. Um, I realize that I have not put a bunch of slides in here that really outline um, MTSS framework, which I think now thinking back on it, probably should have been the first slide that I put after this one. Um, but really what I'm hoping to do is to um, give you an opportunity to develop a deeper understanding of the different things, um, types of MTSS that are happening across the DOE. Um, some of the learning outcomes, we're going to talk very briefly about um, the BAR um, initiative, the SPDIG initiative, the Ease Main grant, Count Me In, interdisciplinary instruction team efforts, multilingual learners, and our continuous school improvement model. And of course, you are earning one hour of um, participation contact hour for your participation today. Um, okay, so I am going to pause for just a moment and take this opportunity to share a different screen with you um, that will briefly go over the, um, the Maine's MTSS framework as it has been developed out um, that way. Um, you kind of have a frame of reference for where all of the, the rest of the information is going to come from. Um, and I, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me to put that in um, um, as the first slide. So forgive me for that. So here we go. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. And then we share.
Okay, so MAIN's MTSSS, the MTSS framework and um, the five components of our MTSS framework. So essentially, we believe that there are five critical components to an MTSS framework. Um, and that our MTSS approach is a tiered approach where one tier um, is provided at the base, which is tier one. And then any of the tiers of support that come on top of it are actually layered on top of that tier one. And so at no point in time do we ever supplant um, one tier for another, right? So as you're providing supports to students, students that are receiving a tier two intensity or tier two level of support, they're getting tier one and tier two. A student that might be receiving tier three intensity would be receiving tier one, tier two, and tier three. And now you can quickly see how it can get a little complicated when thinking about how to provide these supports, given how we have limited number of dollars, limited number of minutes, um, limited number of staff, and things like that during the day. And so it's really important that one of the things that really bolsters that framework is that we look at how our systems run as a whole so that we can stay as true to that layering system as possible when providing supports for groups of students, um, individual students, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are five critical components of Maine's MTSS framework. First being that schools have a leadership team that uses live data to improve teaching and learning. And what I mean by live data is that the data that you use has a shelf life um, and data that is being accessed. So data that has been collected, whether it be at the classroom level or the school level, um, really is only considered live and breathing and useful for decision making if it is accessed and used to make a decision within the first two weeks of collecting the data. Um, and so I understand that there are some things that maybe you're thinking about, well, you know, even our state data is not considered live data then because we don't receive it within a few weeks of students taking the state test, which is correct. Um, but that data is a snapshot of how well your systems are functioning at the time that you took that data. You wouldn't necessarily make um, implementable decisions or short-term implementation decisions with that data, you would make other types of long-term planning decisions with that data. And the second critical component is that schools utilize school-wide and grade level teams that evaluate instructional integrity, student response to instruction and support, and identify growth areas for instructional practice. And that they use um, a universal instructional integrity, meaning that all students are general education students, regardless of whether they have a 504, an IEP, um, or any of the other kinds of ways that we might be grouping students for different, um, for different interventions or different types of approaches and things like that. Um, so school-wide teams, many schools have those, and it's um, and it is kind of it's a relatively common thing to have. But grade-level teams, sometimes also known as PLCs. Um, don't always function as that evaluative team. And so if you are using a PLC or you do have grades that are meeting as teams um, and, and, and in small schools where there might only be one grade level per or one teacher per grade level, you would then implement um, vertical teams of pair, trying to pair adjacent um, grade levels with those teams so that decision making can be made. Um, but really thinking about how you're organizing teams for decision making. And when I say decision making, I'm really pointing back to that live data decision making. Um, and so thinking about how are those teams really looking at growth areas and providing um, insight into improving instructional practice. Um, and that schools are really utilizing those types of teams. The third critical component is that schools are prioritizing effective universal instruction in tier one for all students, regardless of IEP or 504, and that they ensure relevant and timely access to additional and intensified support when indicated. The big thing about this critical component to think about is that schools are basically um, thinking about not pigeonholing different interventions or different programs for kids that have to reach a certain level of failure before they've had an opportunity to get access to those things. Um, and so really thinking about how do we not tier programs, but how do we create systems where all schools or all students rather that have indicated that they have a need for something can get access to that um, as soon as it is indicated, 
One way to do that is brings us down to critical component number four, which is that schools have created a library of evidence-based resources that helps to ensure that equitable access for all students regardless of eligibility for special education and or other student supports. One big flaw in many, many, many MTSS frameworks or some, and some schools are still calling them RTI frameworks. Some schools are saying PBIS frameworks. They're, they're really all in the same vein. Uh, PBIS and RTI are models of an MTSS framework as is the BAR program, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, but one major flaw of these systems tends to be that students have to achieve, which almost seems like an oxymoron, a certain level of failure before they are allowed to receive the thing that comes next in the tiered system, right? And so they have to do a certain thing um, or have, they have to show a certain level of not understanding before we're allowed to give them the thing that could have helped them way back at the beginning. And so when thinking about creating a library of evidence-based supports, we're not saying these are tier two supports, these are tier three supports, these are only available to these students, and this is only available to those students. When something that is, is on a shelf over here could help a group of students that's over here now without them having to go through a multiple set of steps in order to be able to get access to that, right? And so really trying to eliminate the amount of um, unintended gatekeeping, I think, that we do for certain programs in certain areas of our school. So really using that live data to make those decisions. And then the fifth critical component is that schools are really working to create dynamic partnerships with families and community members. Dynamic meaning that, um, that you know, many of our schools will say, yeah, like we engage our parents, we have parent support, our parent um, open house nights, and we have we have, you know, conferences for parents and we have a newsletter that goes home and we have like all these different ways and, and teach and parents know that they can contact us. We give them our phone number. Well, that would be all considered in my view, static um, partnerships with families because they really only go in one way. Um, whereas a dynamic partnership might be one that definitely has more of an ebb and flow, more of a give and take where parents and community members are feeling part of that decision making, part of that school growth, part of that school planning, things like that. Um, I've, I'm, I'm knee deep in some personal projects where I've had to learn a lot about electricity. And I think of dynamic partnerships with families as like, if you think of, of electricity or power, like DC power only goes in one direction and then AC power is like oscillating and it goes in multiple directions. We tend to have systems that look a lot like DC power where the information from school to home goes only, mostly in one direction. We wanna to try to improve that so that it can go in multiple directions. Um, and, and basically be considered more dynamic for supporting our schools. So now that that slide should have been part of today's slideshow, we will go ahead and um, switch back to the um, DOE around the MTSS, uh, MTSS around the main DOE, um, because now you have a foundation for what I'm talking about when I talk about the critical components of MTSS. Does anybody have any questions before we jump into the first program? All right, let's see. Just trying to find, make sure you guys have the right screen now. Okay. And so here we go. Okay, so the first um, MTSS model that I wanna talk about for today's session um, is actually the BAR model. So building assets and reducing risks. Um, maybe using your, um, your participation tools, like you're raising your hand. Um, how many of you are in schools that are currently using the BAR model as part of your school support systems? Did I see one? You're getting trained tomorrow. 
Okay, so somebody said that they're no, no, no longer using bar. Others, does I hear somebody say that they're going to be trained in bar tomorrow? Yep. yep. Great. Okay, good. So bar um, is a type of support that is modeled after MTSS that the main DOE offers as um, a tool for schools. And it has been, I think we're in our second year of bar for, um, for providing bar supports for schools. Um, okay, and so we've got some schools that are using it like across their middle and their high school. Um, I, I have lost you guys. I don't even know, like I can't even see you anymore. There you are. Um, and so um, um, one of the things that is important to know about the bar model is that the bar model really focuses on building relationships across teachers and their students. And they use a type of teaming approach in order to be able to build that system that allows all students to get access to all of those things at when and when they need them. That's the idea basically behind it. Now, whether it works perfectly for every school all the time, I think is something that is, you know, that can be up for conversation um, depending on you know, how, how your school is using it, how well your school is using it, um, you know, and those kinds of things. Can I just get a check? I'm on multiple screens. What are you seeing on your screen? Are you seeing the bar slide that I was showing a few moments ago? You are, okay, good. Um, because on my screen, that is not what I'm seeing anymore. So I need to figure out what's going on. Um, okay, and so then, um, one of the things that Maine is offering is that you can actually sign up to receive support and paying for BAR as a model of MTSS support. And the BAR model really looks at developing that tier one level first by providing opportunities for re relationship building, team building, um, teaming models that really fit well into a tier one setting, um, and then allowing um, those models to grow and develop based on the needs of the students that are around you. One thing that I do like about the BAR model as an MTSS for schools is that um, their tier one meeting structure really aims when functioning properly to ensure that every student in, the, in school gets a seat at the table at least every few meetings so that those students can get recognized and then a discussion can be had about what are their needs that maybe we wouldn't be talking about normally because we're always talking about the high flyers or the heavy hitters or whatever it is that it's happening over here. And so it really kind of slows the system down a little bit and allows for some thinking and functioning about thinking about um, all of the students that are in front of us and really making sure that we've given the time for figuring out the needs and how to meet those needs of those kids. They offer things like spreadsheets and other types of organization um, approaches that can kind of help teachers to get these things in place. Um, and so it is a model that is used um, quite a bit around the world or around the U.S. Um, and parts of Canada that are um, and if you like it, you really like it. And if you don't like it, sometimes it's just not a great fit for your school, but it is a great model of how to meet all six of those are all five of those critical components of Maine's MTSS. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to send us off into breakout rooms um, for a few moments for folks to share. What do you know about the bar model? Are you participating in the bar model? Um, what questions maybe do you have? And um, what is some, what are some other questions that you might um, or what's an action step that you might take in terms of learning more about BAR model, um, if it's something that you'd like to access in the future in terms of MTF, MTSS for your school. Um, and so I'm going to break us out into groups where it's just like two or three participants. And we're gonna take, um, looks like four minutes. So it's quick um, to have a quick discussion about BAR.
Okay, welcome back. Um, four minutes is not a long time <laughs> to be able to have a conversation with a group. I understand that. Um, but hopefully just, um, it just allows for a little bit of opportunity to network a little bit while we're here together. Okay, so the second program that I want to talk about um, in today's toolbox session um, is actually the interdisciplinary instruction team um, and some of the opportunities that exist through the interdisciplinary instruction team um, for MTSS supports. And um, so hopefully you are seeing uh, the interdisciplinary instruction slide. Um, but ultimately, there are three areas that I want to talk about in terms of availability of um, MTSS support through the inter interdisciplinary instruction team. The first being um, the A-list um, opportunity that the, the team offers support with, the early learning approach that our um, early learning team offers, and then also multilingual learning and the supports that are available for multilingual learners. And so ultimately, the A-List um, is a program or a component of the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary instruction team that allows for assistance with matching interventions to student needs. And it's particularly helpful in the 6 through 12 for grades 6 through 12. Um, and it is a, it's a process that is taught that basically takes you through looking at your student data, figuring out what you're going to, what kind of decisions you're going to make with that data, and then figuring out what are the interventions that you're going to use in order to match with that data to get, um, to get interventions to students. One thing that the A-list isn't is a specific set of interventions or a specific set of tools. It's basically a process. It outlines a process that you can use to help make those interventions um, match student needs. And when thinking about the implementation framework, uh, Maine's implementation framework, it really looks at those critical priorities of two, three, and four, because it really looks at how your teams are reviewing that data and how they're helping to ensure that you are being able to access um, evidence-based based resources that are matched to student needs and helps to work on um, creating that library of resources that you need in order to be able to meet those needs of those students. The early learning team um, has a, a variety of opportunities, learning opportunities for schools that really help to ensure um, good, solid quality tier one instruction from everything from early childhood pre-K and all the way up through, um, I think we have K for, there's K for me, first for me, and second for me that are all opportunities. And these programs are really designed to help strengthen that tier one layer of support for schools and really hone in on um, critical component of number one, which is school leadership teams using live data. Number two, grade level teams that are evaluating instructional integrity and how to provide opportunities for students based on structural integrity. And number five, which is that critical component of, of dynamic partnerships. So if you haven't had an opportunity to look at what the early learning team is offering for instruction support, um, I would highly recommend that folks um, take an opportunity to do that because when looking at Maine's implementation framework, and if you're focusing on that grade band or that level of, um, you know, that age group and those and schools and personnel that are supporting those age groups, um, those programs really are designed to implement um, all five of the, impl the implementation framework priorities. In terms of multilingual learning, we have um, a very, very passionate group of people that are helping to support the development of multilingual programming across the state, especially as, as um, communities are really, really looking at how to meet the needs of multilingual learners that are coming into their communities at the rate that they're coming into the communities. And so um, if you haven't had an opportunity, they do offer a monthly newsletter that will highlight all of the different things that they um, are offering throughout the month, um, learning opportunities that are available throughout the month. Um, 
And when thinking about how their work supports the framework, you know, they are really focusing on those items three, four, and five. So critical component three, which is looking at how do we intensify our universal instruction in tier one to meet the needs of multilingual learners right at the core of our instruction. Um, really thinking about building out those library, that library of resources for students. Um, and then that fifth one being absolutely critical for um, the multilingual instruction. And that is supporting those dynamic partnerships with families. Um, and so really, if you haven't had an opportunity to check out their website, I would highly recommend it because if you have um, multilingual learners in your school, if you have friends that have multilingual learners in your school and you're looking to um, think about or integrate or to um, really sort of evaluate whether the work that you're doing in multilingual education is helping to improve your MTSS framework, then there's definitely some um, exploration that you could do to help bolster that and to kind of get that off the ground for you. And so what I'll do now is I will break us out into um, our groups again. And um, if you are someone that has access either the A-list or have um, access to an early learning opportunity or a multilingual opportunity, you could share that um, with your group and then maybe talk a little bit about how, how it helps to provide student supports um, in your school and help answer questions for those that maybe have them regarding, um, regarding their experience with that. So the third program that I want to talk about today um, in terms of MTSS framework um, is the State Personnel Development Grant, which is actually out of the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. Um, and they have a couple of projects that are being funded by this um, state personnel grant, hope I'm not misspeaking, um, that really are aligned with MTSS and um, can highlight um, multiple of the critical components of a school-wide MTSS. So the first one um, that I wanted to talk about that's happening is Math for Me. And um, Math for Me is a pro uh, is a sort of a homegrown program that is um, developed for schools. And it is essentially a focus on how to make math more approachable <laughs> for not only students, but educators as well. So if you haven't, um, if you don't know a lot about the Math For Me um, um, program that Jen Robitaille and I'm gonna forget her last name, but Sue, Logan. Sue, Logan. Uh, so it's not Hogan. You're Logan. She's Hogan. Okay. Okay. So I wasn't sure if you were saying Logan. I was like, no, I don't think it's Logan. <laughs> okay. So Sue Hogan. Um, and what I really like about um, Math for Me as a MTSS tool for schools to use is that it does encompass all five of the critical components of an MTSS implementation framework. So they really focus on um, using live data, leadership teams using live data, utilizing multiple levels of teams in order to evaluate universal instructional integrity, uh, prioritizing those tier one efforts for all students. Um, and then when tier one isn't quite enough, 
um, the Math for Me program is really striving to help schools apply and understand how to do those layering of supports, right, um, for those tiers and not supplanting tiers. So kids don't go from tier one to tier two. They are always a tier one student that might be receiving a tier two intensity or a tier three intensity at the point they need it and providing support for how to layer those supports um, in the math domain. Um, they also really help schools to look at how to create those library, that library of math resources so that we're not waiting for levels of failure for students in order to be able to get access to those supports. One critical feature of the Math for Me program that I really like in terms of MTSS implementation is their teacher of influence model, where they actually have someone sign on as a teacher of influence that helps to provide like in-house support and coaching like within that school that is participating in the Math for Me program, which I really like because it helps to ensure that these critical components are being implemented. Um, and then I know that they do work really hard to help schools to create those dynamic partnerships in the math domain. Um, in my world, though I like to see MTSS as much more of a global domain, um, but in this case, that would be very math related. So if you had multiple different initiatives going on, we could help braid together how those initiatives are going on to create those dynamic partnerships, but math domain does a really good job at that. Um, the AIM literacy mod modules is something that started this past summer, and when I got thinking about whether um, I wanted to highlight the modules, um, and I'm not sure that these are being done by the actual SPDIG grant, but I do know that this is an, this is an initiative that does come out of the Office of um, Special Services and Inclusive Education. Um, and when I really got thinking about the literacy modules as part of an implementation MTSS framework, I really thought, yes, this is something that needs to be highlighted as a as part of your school's implementation framework, because it really hones in on um, critical components three and four. So when thinking about um, how schools are prioritizing universal instruction, um, and thinking of creating a library of resources, it really ha is helping schools to look at their literacy instruction, how they're providing literacy instruction, and how to really bolster the skills of their educators so that we can continue to enhance that effective universal tier one instruction for literacy. Um, and so um, really, if you're thinking, oh, like I have teachers that have participated in the literacy model and modules, or I've participated in the literacy modules. Um, if you were to say, well, how is this helping my school with their implementation framework? You could say, these are things that I'm doing that are helping me to, to really work on and enhance critical components three and four of Maine's MTSS framework. And collectively, those things all start to come together to create robust um, implementation systems across your school. The other thing that's being done out of this particular program or office is the very robust PBIS support system that is created or the, the, the PBIS cohort system that is that, that has been created and grown almost exponentially over the course of the last couple of years. Um, and so if you are a quote unquote PBIS school or you're a school that is using PBIS as your main form of MTSS, um, that program that Courtney Angelisanti and her team have put together um, really encompasses all five of these critical components in terms of positive behavior interventions and supports. And what I like about um, how that model that Courtney's team is doing and when I think about the global view of an MTSS implementation framework, the skills and the practices that you learn in their modules or in their um, cohorts can be expanded and applied to academic supports, to um, individualized domains such as literacy or math, and can really be grown upon. And so if you're a school that has really started to bite into this particular type of MTSS, it is something that can be grown and expanded when you find feel that you're getting you're at a point where you're like okay like I feel like we've got a good grip on this we've got the five critical components that are really being implemented well now it's time to expand you don't have to learn something new to expand once you have those processes in place that you learn through the PBIS cohort um, and so uh, using your um, your interaction tools, is anybody here a PBIS in a PBIS cohort? Okay, so I see at least one, two. Okay, cool, awesome. 
if I missed you, I apologize. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break us off again so you can talk a little bit about whether each of any, if you've participated in any of these, what questions you might have for each other. Um, and we'll come back together and we'll talk about the fourth one for today. And that's all we're gonna have time for. Um, all right. So off we go.